So Andy, welcome to this edition of the Virtual Villeville Vest Conference. Uh, for those who sadly so far have missed out on your career, would you like to just quickly introduce us, yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Oh, thanks, Wyndham. Uh, where do I start? I'm a musician primarily. Um, I am a label owner. Um, I've I used to work at the PRS. I've been a tour manager. Um, at the moment, I also teach music futures at BIM in Berlin. Um, so yeah, I've kind of got a bit of a broad experience of the music industry, I suppose, from different angles, like a lot of people. But uh, yeah, so I've been doing that for since as long as I can remember. I started a label called Bronze Rat Records, um, primarily to release music by the projects I was involved in. And so um, that was a baptism of fire because, you know, I started working with some international artists like the John Spencer Blues Explosion and C6 Steve um, and, you know, without any formal training or business training. And so I basically became immersed in it in the, in the punk rock DIY kind of way. Uh, yeah, and since then, um, and that's an ongoing concern, but um, yes, since uh, I've been in Berlin for a while. And yeah, in the last three years, I've been teaching music business, essentially, in, 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 in BIM. So one of your specialties is the, the topic of music centric payments, music centric payments even. Um, for musicians on streaming platforms, I believe. It's a hot topic at the moment. Um, it's, you know, essentially the, the thing that everybody's talking about with regards to streaming. I've become aware of it and immersed myself in, and tried to understand, you know, is this, a, is this a, 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 you know, is this the future? When I teach music futures, you know, it's, it's a question that I get asked. And so, um, yeah, I've, I've something I've been researching a lot. And not just me, it's, it's uh, something that's been uh you know the subject of several studies in the last couple of years uh to see how valid how valid it is um as a as a payment method for streaming it appears to me that the most sort of notorious problem with streaming and its payments to musicians as they stand at the moment with this pro rata system as it's called they're frighteningly low um the biggest villains in the picture appear to be the biggest company uh, outside of China anyway, which is Spotify, but I know Spotify are not by any means the only people who work like this. I think every streaming agency, almost without exception, does. I mean, but as an example, Spotify pays artists less than half a cent per stream. Uh, Co-founder and CEO Daniel X actually worth about $4 billion himself. And Spotify's own figures suggest that only 43,000 top tier artists in the world can make a living from Spotify, whereas the bottom 10% are seeing an average payment of $144 a year. But there are a whole mass of other reasons why payments are so low. So I know it's a challenge. Can you just talk us sort of very through the very, very basics of how a company like Spotify or Tidal calculates the payments that it is making? Okay, so to single out any one of them, the reason why Spotify is single out is because they have the largest market share. So, you know, but I have to say just from the get go, I am a fan of streaming. I don't have a problem with it. Um, but, you know, systemically, there's uh definitely issues that need to be ironed out and they are being ironed out i think but the reality is is there's discontent discontent from the artistic communities especially so you can't brush that under the carpet people have been brushing it under the carpet i mean i can i can just backtrack and say i remember when um you know it was on the horizon and um you know people were very very enthusiastic about it i was at the time, I was a bit skeptical. I mean, the floodgates were open and that was fine, but I kept, you know, I kept being tried to be herded. A lot of the people that I was working with were trying to be herded to, to promote these platforms. And, um, if, you know, the argument being at the time, there's no evidence that it cannibalizes sales. Now, I remember thinking at the time, well, how can you prove, even prove that? You know, it's you can't even prove that to yourself as a music consumer, you know, your own buying and listening habits. What? made you buy that record as opposed to streaming it you know it's 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 very difficult to but the fact is that music consumers being herded into that sphere felt reckless to me and lo and behold now we're at this point now where people are going hang on a minute this you know we waited to see how, how it would evolve and it's not evolving really and so the the way that that streaming is paid out is uh it's a pro rata model and it's based on a, 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 a service-wide pool of money that is distributed depending on the amount of streams 
a percentage of streams. Um, the figure is low. There's lots of different reasons for that. Yes, of course, um, you know, we meant to treat it like a radio station. That was the early argument. It's, like, it's meant to be, it's like radio and you're getting paid and it all be accumulative over a longer period of time. But the reality is, is that, yeah, the discontent is there. The stigma is there and it's there for a reason. And so now we're, and that's why everyone's having this conversation. And what's come out of this um, discontent is a big conversation in the industry about the shift to a the potential shift to a user centric model. Now, the user centric model is to put simply um, where if you are a music if you let's say, for example, you're a subscriber to one of these uh, DSPs and you listen to specific tracks during that subscription month, then your money is goes directly to that music that that you've been listening to, 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 to the rights holders. Um, and people are very keen on this model because um, there's a direct cause and effect. It's, you, you can, it's transparent. And the argument is, is that for an user, for, so for a user, for a uh, music consumer, they, like, they might like that model more because, and, and feel more inclined to uh, move up to, a, to pay, start paying on a subscription rather than use the ad-based one knowing that their music, that sorry, that their money is uh, going directly to the artists that they love as opposed to being pooled and going out to artists that they hate. Because <laughs> there is something weird about, you know, if I stream, say, Talk Talk, because I'm a huge Talk Talk fan, it's a bit odd thinking that that money's going to go to Black Eyed Peas instead. Well, yeah, I guess that's the, the strange thing about it. So, but can you... It's can you... murky. You can't really... You don't really know where your money is going. Um, but... This way, it's very obvious where your money is going because you know that what you've listened to, and so that's what you've decided to spend your money on. Yeah. If you have a uh, a budget, a music budget, and you you know you know which music you're gonna go and buy. So that, that that's essentially it in a nutshell. The, with regards to the user centric model, it's kind of irrelevant in the sense that that ad generated revenue would still be allocated to the music that you listen to. The problem is 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 uh, is that it's untested uh, in real life, and I think. But they've, there's a lot of models have been tested behind the scenes with varying outcomes and opinions. But f I think that um, the next stage is that we will start to see it rolled out, and then we'll be able to see how it actually affects things in real life and what the f what the f the feeling is about it. Then, um, if it works, uh, on the one hand, you know. User-centric model is essentially meant to uh, benefit smaller or mid-mid-level artists a lot more than the current model. On the on the same on the uh, on on the other hand, you know, Apple did an internal test uh, recently, and they said, "Beware of this model because, you know, at the you know, for example, and they use Taylor Swift as an example. Taylor Swift generates a lot of streams, and that money." Is being shared around to all artists, which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I keep thinking, well, she shouldn't be happy about that either. <laughs> you know, obviously, the industry had a sort of turn of the century peak before Napster and and other downloading and torrenting site, uh, sites uh, started stealing from the industry's pocket. Um, and we now seem to be back to a point where industry revenue is almost as high as it was at that point. But the artists aren't seeing that money. So where's that money going? Well, okay. We have to think about this, the, um, the money, the, the revenue stream is going to rights holders. So on, so there's the issue of whether an art, what kind of deal an artist has with a label for a start. Um, you know, the old contracts didn't anticipate streaming and so those old models and don't you know those small percentages when you when you bring it into a, a streaming conversation it is minuscule um so there's that but the the where is the money going i mean it's 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 going to this dsps who have certain overheads so that they take a percentage and then the rest goes to the right so is the, the rest is split between the rights holders so the master owners um, then there's mechanical royalty um, and then there's uh, songwriters basically get paid, and there's there's three areas of discontent there. So there's there's the there's the performers who are um, you know 
unhappy with the, their, you know, their income from streaming, whether it be via a label or not, even the ones who have a direct di direct distribution deal and releasing on their own imprints or whatever. Um, and then there's another conversation is that songwriters are not getting paid enough either. So that uh, calculation, the, the, the difference bet of, the difference was this, is that with publishing, it, 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 it wasn't negotiated in the first place, but when the... Um, the masters were negotiated early on with the, the lab the ma with the major labels that was negotiated. So right. it, it happened after. It's happening now. It happened after the fact. So to me, it would seem that if if I'm playing a, a, a song on a, a a DSP, and I know that the money from my subscription that I have paid is going directly to that artist, the optics of that are infinitely better. Absolutely, yeah. So. So why is it so hard for people to consider this idea as be, or why was it not even adopted in the first place? Well, it's definitely being considered now. Um, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that, you know, as streaming becomes is spreading out globally to places like South America and India, it actually might benefit a lot of even the majors who've been a little bit reluctant to endorse it. It might be the time that, the right time for them now because you know not every stream has the same value for a start um subscription fees in certain territories are going to be a lot less for example you know 50 50 listeners uh, on a dsp in the us which is a far wealthier country than india would, would, would generate more income than 50 listeners in um in india for example combine that with the fact that you know in these uh New, newer territories where you know they, they, they're more likely to be listening to domestic product product songs uh, which the majors don't own and so a pro rata model could backfire in that case a major label back catalog would be worth a lot more if it was generating its real actual you know revenue if it was coming straight back just like as, as you would go and buy an LP from a from a store that would then go you know that's not calculated pro rata is it so yeah, it's kind of going back to a, a a more traditional way, in a sense. So yeah, because at the moment, I think the major labels in particular seem to be nervous of user centric because it will scoop out money from their biggest earners. But at the same time, this back catalogue is not earning them a great deal of money because its plays are so low that it doesn't really impact upon the percentage of the streams. Is that right? Allegedly, it remains to be seen. If uh, um, again, I'm not I'm not privy to the accounts so i don't know um, how that actually plays out for them but in theory i would imagine that that would be that would be the case for sure so why has it taken so long do you think for this idea to become more uh widespread as it is at the moment and and uh do you think a lot of it has got to do with the pandemic for instance the fact that people are talking about this as much as they are now i don't think so because these these conversations were, were being had like last year, the year before, but I think that it's exacerbated the need to talk about it. Um, it that's why Bandcamp is so popular at the moment, you know, because they, they um, a lot of fans can see that they are directly supporting an artist. There, there is a middleman, of course, Bandcamp, in the same sense that, you know, a DSP with a user-centric model is still a middleman taking a cut, but it feels a little bit fairer. They're still providing service, right? Um, like I said, I am a fan of streaming. I think it's, the technology is 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 there, um, but yeah, I think um, it's like you said. It just feels transparent. It is transparent. It's 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 easier to understand. Deezer are rolling it out this year. Apparently, um, it hasn't happened yet. Interestingly, I don't know why, but they're big on it. A lot of the a lot of the independents are big on it. I believe digital. They're really kind of pushing for it. A lot of people are pushing for it. Even the majors in Scandinavia are pushing for it because um, they can see how it would benefit them too. Because, yeah, you mentioned Deezer. So Deezer announced it would test out user-centric payments uh, at the start of this year, in France at least. Yeah. And from what I understand, the reason that they haven't done so is because they have not been able to persuade the major labels to take part in this. Um, why? Like, why, why would a major label honestly not be prepared to see whether or not this works in France, in one single territory? You have to ask them. 
<laughs> <laughs> they don't take we my calls. We can guess, you know. The fact is, it's very lucrative for major labels to be uh, in, in a pool-based system when they're on when they are the have the largest share of, of streams across the world. As soon as that starts to change, then yeah, they would you know take a little bit of a hit. But it's fair's fair, right? So I also understand that Deezer have been carrying out studies uh, with labels about user-centric payments, but uh, only the labels themselves have seen the results. And, and it's sort of curious to me as to why they're being so secretive as well. The labels are not sharing that information generally. It's not out there. I think because the dust hasn't settled, rather than it being a conspiratorial thing, it's that, that they need to know for sure um, that it's actually fair for everybody. They don't want, okay, for, well, with major labels, that's one thing. With indie labels, it could backfire on indie labels, I guess, if like you have a less successful artist uh, and, and they start earning less because of the user-centric model. But, you know, so be it. I think we should, it just needs to be seen. Uh, in real life, it just needs to be um, understood. I know that managers of a number of, uh, of high-profile German acts, including um, Rammstein, wrote to major labels earlier this year as well, demanding a reassessment of payment systems um, and suggesting that they too were leading towards uh, user-centric uh, payments. Do you do you see at the moment like a wave building at quite a speed, or is it still quite slow at this point? I think there's been some trepidation, you know. Like even from managers, a lot of managers have been actively promoting, trying to get on playlists. Don't want to ruin that relationship a little bit. Uh, um, you know, very nervous about um, saying anything ill towards some of the DSPs. And also, this yeah, it's only just starting to gain traction. Um, and again, even within the industry, a lot of people don't understand how it works. Um, they just. I've seen have seen the DSPs not necessarily as a source of income, but as a, as a profile raising exercise. But that that's the problem is that it's it can't be just seen as a profile ec exercise when you know it's the the primary mode of consumption. So that's now now that they realise that that's what's happened because it's become so successful and rightly so. Then okay, I'm trying to change it after the fact. That's the, the issue. Another thing that uh, I know people speak about as being one of the strengths of user-centric payments is, uh, is that it can help prevent what I think they call scam streams. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about, about what scam streams are and, and how user-centric payments might actually prevent this? Yeah, so basically um, scam, scam, scam streams would be mainly on ad-generated um, accounts, I guess. But... Um, you know, the famous example was the Bulgarian account that was, you know, basically just playing on automatic, automatically playing things on repeat and just generating in income that way. Um, if it's a if it's a sub subscription based user centric model, let's put the ad thing aside, then it's a closed loop. You know, you can't uh, you can't. I, at least I haven't been able to come up with a way of scamming it. <laughs> and you've you know? tried. No, not yet. <laughs> but yeah, because you know we, we've been putting models together uh, with some colleagues to see if you know on 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 some new models and and to see what uh, is scammable. But if you've got a system where you are paying X amount per month and you only listen to that one song, um, that money goes there. If you're repeatedly playing. Um, that song, it doesn't matter because it's not based on clicks. It's based on um, your money. The, the amount of money is the same. So, so once you've paid a hundred times or a thousand times, as long as there's only ten a ten euro subscription, they're only going to get their percentage of that. The seven exactly. euros that's left after the DSP's taken the money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the notable thing I think about the Bulgarian scam was that they themselves, I think, or somebody involved with the scam had provided the very streams that, or the, the very music that was being streamed. And, yes. what I, and what was fascinating about that was that they were choosing 30 to 40 second pieces of music yeah. they had written. So there were multiple pieces of music. Now, what I found interesting about that was the idea that a 35 second piece of music I think can earn pretty much the same as Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata or 
a, a 15 minute Godspeed You Black Emperor post rock track? I mean, why is no one taking the length of a piece of music into account? Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. It's not fair system. And um, it's just, you know, with uh, there's also a lot of books on there now. So uh, arguably, the time based model um, would 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 be fa much fairer because you have only have a certain amount of hours in the day to listen to stuff. So if you choose to listen to uh, a talking book, or if you choose to listen to Beethoven all the way through, then the, the allocation is based on on time rather than streams. That's the difference. That that is a a central argument for the user centric model being much much fairer. Well, Andy, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. Thank you. I hope that next time we'll be able to do this in Bergen beneath a cloudy sky. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you take you up on that. I love it in Bergen. Please let me come. <laughs> <laughs>